freedom. And fortunately for you, I've got Mr. Todd Newell with us who can speak more intelligently to it than I can. Todd, tell everybody who you are, what you do for us. Uh, my name is Todd Newell. I'm the VP of Technology for Engineering, based out of our Houston, Texas office. All right, that's a simple question, Todd. What is it? <laughs> what is it? Um, Freedom is a subsea robot. It's uh, actually a configurable robot. The configuration that's shown here is the uh, infield inspection uh, configuration. And, and this isn't just a model. No, that's a that's a real robot. It uh, it goes from here over to our living labs over in Norway for uh, sea trials and qualifications starting at the first uh, of October. The, the TV screens aren't part of it. No, that, that, the, that's the part we bolted on. But it, yeah, we'll see how deep we can take that iPad before it crashes. But uh, but this actual model, actual working model. That's that's a working uh, robot. Nice. Right. Yes. Why? why? Why did we build something like this? Uh, we, you know, we've had a lot of requests coming in from uh, customers. When you actually took all those requests and tried to, if you actually tried to build a machine to meet all those needs, it would look like a Frankenstein. Uh, Robot, right? Because it was very difficult to get all the functionality needed into one system. But as you can see from that machine, it does not look like a Frankenstein. And and part of the key there is to make it configurable to where it can change. The middle section can stay the same, and then the bits on the end can change depending upon what the scopes of work are. The two main versions will be this infield version, uh, and then there'll be a survey version. But then there's all, you can look on the little iPad monitor over there, there's also other convert, other modules. I'll just run the video too while you're talking. Yep. If that's all right. Yep. This is showing in the infield. Um, the primary business driver is, is, is how do you get a subsea robot uh, to where you no longer need the vessel topside, but you can still provide the value subsea. About 40% of the task, there's, well, let me back up. There's a hundred, there's a hundred different tasks that an ROV does or an AUV does in the subsea world today. 40% of those, actually 46 of those tasks, can be completed by this machine uh, in autonomous mode, uh, subsea. By doing that, you can eliminate the, the, the vessel topside. That's a big uh, call savings, but uh, in line with the theme of this particular conference, it's also a big CO2 footprint uh, reduction. When you consider uh, how much CO2 a, a, a service vessel creates versus a machine that's run off of battery power. Okay, and you know, there can be an umbilical connected to it or not. I mean, walk through that real quick, so everybody. I want to make sure everybody gets yep. that. So on this machine, we've got we've got tooling. We got interfaces on the front and on the back. Both those interfaces are for tooling, but also for us to retether and be able to pilot this machine. This machine will have three modes of operation. You'll be able to pilot it with a joystick, just like an ROV. You'll be able to do supervisory control to where if you only have uh, through water comms. Um, wireless, subsea wireless or blue comms, you'll be able to do supervisory control with a pilot, or when you have no communication, the machine can do the functions autonomously. So, you, you know, you, you told me a good story comparing this to like a, an electric automobile. You, uh, you want to run through that again? Because I don't remember that story. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> so, I mean, a lot like a Tesla, that, that, yeah. that there's... That the, gas stations, if you will, but, but places yeah. that they can refuel? Uh, for an example, uh, with this Freedom vehicle, we did a calculation. Uh, part of the, the exercise was to build enough endurance in this machine to get some reasonable uh, distance, coverage distance, before it would need recharging. This machine can go about 200 kilometers um, before it needs to recharge and then do work in that activity. Now, if you consider that, uh, and if you consider all the uh, subsea wells on the Norwegian continental shelf, which is a, a significant amount of them, 14 of these machines could cover that entire uh, group of subsea assets with, with only uh, 14 docking stations and 14 machines but because they would have enough endurance to cover the, uh, that territory. Now, in other parts of the world where the uh, fields are spread out a lot more, then this machine would not have the endurance to make that kind of coverage before we recharge. And, and you know, every, everybody, everybody asks, how, how do you charge this thing? How does it maintain power? Uh, there's a few different ways. This is, the, the main way is you will have a uh, subsea docking station that will be powered through a power and comms to the subsea uh, infrastructure. You can also have, uh, if you're going into a brownfield and you've got enough power 
available within that infrastructure. You can trickle charge into maybe into a, a battery bank that's in a docking station, and then you're basically charging from that into this vehicle. Also, there's other technologies coming online in the marketplace with the, uh, with the uh, wave harvester buoys that can generate power enough to trickle charge one of these machines. Or, or you could put a, a subsea fuel cell into the docking station and then again, it's all about you know, getting the power uh, in order to, you know, that, to where the machine can be subsea resident for as much time as possible. Okay. This machine is designed to be uh, six months at a time um, resident with no, uh, with no need for technicians or any kind of maintenance. And, and I always like to ask you this question just to, because I, I love your answer. No, nothing to building this, right? No challenges whatsoever to make, to make one of these? Uh, none at all. <laughs> Actually, the, meeting the, uh, the maintenance, the, the, the no maintenance requirement was a, was a really big challenge. Today's RO, the way ROVs are built and the way that business model works, because there's the, the, the top side infrastructure is as remote piloting as you get, everything's designed towards that. Now, it's not that an, that an ROV needs a maintenance guy after every dive, but they're, they're, they are designed for, with technologies that where the uh, people are resident and available to that machine. So a technician is, from a criticality standpoint, a technician is available if need be. In this use case, that's no longer the case. So the, so the technology has to be risen, r raised the reliability level in order to be, meet the business case. Okay. Yeah. Look, so see, how do I trust this thing? To like, how do I trust my Tesla to stay in the lines as I'm going down the road? I mean, talk about trusting this thing to work. Yeah, there's a you have to do a lot of testing. Uh, and it, it basically starts with uh, simulation, then simulation is one layer, and then you build upon that layer to do a significant amount of testing. These kind of these kind of vehicles do require more qualification uh, testing and programs than than the than the robots of the past because you are taking that man out of the loop. And with the man out of the loop, it does require a lot more data in order to, to actually get a reliability and, and a capability score that will meet all of our expectations from a, from a safety standpoint. So I want one, and uh, I want it now. I mean, is it available now? It'll be available for service um, come Q1 of next year. We do not sell these vehicles. We're a service provider, so it, it won't be available for sale. And savings, talk to me about the monetary value. Am I, how am I going to save money on this thing? Uh, it can, it, in some of the use cases that we've run for multiple clients, it can eliminate uh, an MSV, a full year's contract for an MSV vessel by having one of these. Now, it's not one of these that's just staying in one spot all the time. There is a, it does need to travel around. Because you got to remember, most of the, well, not most, but this is an inspection machine for the most part. It does have tooling capability on it, so it can, sometimes you actually need some tooling interfaces in order to complete the inspection tasks. Things aren't always clean that you actually need to inspect, so there's going to be some light cleaning. Also, customers have asked this machine to be able to turn valves. So it, it does have the ability and have some tooling capability in order to do those tasks. But where the limitations on this machine come into play is when when you need to do uh, some sort of uh, jetting or pumping uh, application, or if you're going to be need, it's not it's not really designed for the construction phase of our market, to where you're moving around heavy flying leads. All of those kind of tasks really consume power uh, real fast, and that's really that's where the work class ROV is definitely in its uh, swim lane in order to take care of those high power tasks. But about 40% of the tasks this machine can accomplish. Look, I mean. We, we have a script, but look at all the people. I think people are going to have questions, which is probably, and you like okay. that better anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, what are some questions that you guys have? Somewhere there's a microphone right there floating around. Questions. This is going to be much more fun if you guys try to trip me up, trip Todd up. I like it when people do that. Who's got a question? Hey, hang on. We, got a, we, got a, we, bought, we rented this microphone. You have this to is uh, 6,000 meters. Again, for everybody. The, the maximum depth of this machine is 6,000 meters. We decided not to design a shallow water machine uh, for a few different reasons. There are some uh, markets deep water, uh, mainly for, uh, for military applications that were in target. But there's a big, when you start designing a shallow water machine and then start making it deeper, what happens is, is you end up getting into major design, redesign activities to go deep. When we looked at this one, 
we decided, you know, do we design it 4,000 or 6,000? But when we looked at it and the way this hall is constructed, it really didn't matter. So you might as well go as deep as you can go. More questions. This is, is there we got one right here. What happens uh, when it fails? It sinks? It can, uh, two options of failure. It can sink and reside, or in some, in some, if it's configured in some operations, it can actually pop up and float and you gotta go find it. Never now, ask, but never if you're not, if, huh? I said never ask that yeah. question again. But if no one's around, right, and the mission knows that there's no one around for retrieval, you'll have it uh, park itself, and then you'll go recover it. Because if you, if in that situation, if you let it pop top side, top side, now the currents are gonna take this thing, and you know somebody on the beach in Hawaii somewhere may find it, and you may not get it back. More questions. Right, go ahead. You got another one? You have another question? More question, there's one. What's the current going to work in? These thrusters will allow it to work in high currents. Uh, also, it, it, what's helpful is not having the umbilical or the tether, uh, but it's not, it is for inspection only in those kind of environments. But uh, one of the target markets is, uh, is also in the renewable market around the, uh, the monopiles of the, of the wind turbines, and then also inspection, inspecting the long, um, uh, export uh, cable uh, lines, uh, so it can work in shallow water and deep water, and in high current. And I don't know the current. There's a guy over here that can answer the current question. I don't know that number. Is it Lance? Yeah. Lance, come over here when you get a chance. He's probably going to go hide. But if Lance comes up, we'll get that answer. Yeah. If you else? need that answer, or Sarah. We Sarah might know. I don't see Sarah either. Everyone Sarah, disappeared. There, there, All go. my backup. Look at this. Go give Sarah the current. What kind of current? Can it? What's the Speed. Up to six knots. Well, that's speed, but uh, oh, six knots of current. Yeah. yeah. And don't run off, sir. We're going to need you to sit more. More questions. Okay, this is where you guys don't get shy. Come on. Really? As as you guys work up the courage to ask another question, uh, this gentleman has a question. Yeah, hi there. What sort of a job specification would I need to present to you where you would prescribe this as the uh, solution? It's almost like we paid you for that question. <laughs> That's a good one. Here, give that guy a pass. No, it, um, it's basically a task that are, that are being performed by an AUV or an ROV today, knowing that there's going to be some limitations once you get into uh, complex work or high power or high power consumption work that an ROV would use. So, of those hundred tasks that I mentioned, the very first thing that we would do is we would discuss that list. And then we could we would basically work through which ones could be in scope and which ones are out of scope and for what reason. But it is a pretty um, it can meet a lot of different applications and then it can be reconfigured. So for survey, the, the difference in the survey module is is this front piece comes off. You don't need the tool changer. Uh, you would actually put a much longer nose on it. In that nose section, you would actually you could put more power in. You would also have uh, room for your uh, side scanners and your sub-bottom profiler uh, tool. In the, this, this version can do pipeline inspection, but it can't do full surveys, but there is a configuration for that. As we wait, oh, we got some questions over here. Hang on, we we'll better bring you the mic. And then while we're waiting, you see that humongous fishbowl that Fiona's got? Make sure she gets your business card because we are giving away, we don't tell people this until you sit down, but we are giving away an Echo Dot at the end of this, so if you want a chance to win, just give her your card. Sorry, this is pretty cool right here because Thank this. You, you want? Uh, go ahead. <laughs> It'll come back. It'll come back. Can you explain how the inspection data is went back to the beach? Right. How it works? So once this machine plugs back in, that data gets transferred through the power and comms cable. So while it's doing its autonomy mission, right here, actually, that's it, right there. Yeah, that data is not being transmitted, right? But then once it parks. It can be transmitted. What, what interface is what network? What is that? Okay. It's just a fiber optic cable going through the, the power and comms cable through this. How long it for this to get this charged when the ones is up in the docking station? Two, oh, good question. Sarah. I, I can't remember the answer to that question. Um, I, I can't remember that. So well, Sarah will be back here in a second if she didn't run it, away. It's, it's less than a day. But it's uh, more than four hours, but I can't remember the number. Sarah, how long to, to charge? 
Some of that depends uh, upon, yeah, it does depend upon the sort, the power source that you're charging from. There, there's 50 kilowatt hours worth of batteries inside this system. So that, that question is kind of, it kind of, it's a depends answer to that question. Uh-oh, another question over here. I bet Lance knows. Lance, where are you hiding? I don't know. He's probably having pizza like I do. Hi, Dorothy Burr, EIP. How does this compare to your uh, EROV system that's working with the Equinor projects? All right, it's complementary. The, what, what the, uh, the EROV system is actually a full work class ROV. Uh, so it does have manipulators on it. And uh, now what it's tied, it's tethered to uh, a big subsea battery bank, right? And it's intended for, um, to be dropped off and then it can do um, subsea IMR work within a thousand meter tether length, and it'll be remote piloted from shore. So I'm not having to use any autonomy, right? I don't have to trust the autonomy. It's still, it's still controlling vehicles the way the industry does today, other than it's being remotely operated from our offices instead of uh, the ship. So it does eliminate the, um, the uh, vessel time. So the vessels drop it off, the vessels go and do something else, and then two to three weeks later, the vessels come and pick it up. The vessels can actually recharge it with the remaining subsea, or it, when it picks it up, it can recharge it on the deck and then take it and then drop it off again. So the intent is for that to basically be bouncing around, moving, being moved around a lot because of the, the, the range limitation. What this machine can do, it can do all of that, but it doesn't have the uh, tether. So it's got more range capability. So when, when it's got its subsea battery bank or, or station that it's hooked to, it can swim out uh, up, to 200 kilo, up to 200 kilometers, right? So it's just a matter of range. What this one won't be able to do is some of the uh, tasks that the ROV can do. And one of the big adoption rate uh, tasks is going to be flying the riser, doing a riser inspection. Today, that's a, that's a piloted task by the ROV. One of the key milestones for this vehicle is when the industry, or any other vehicle like this one, when the industry is comfortable with letting the riser being flown autonomously by these kind of vehicles, that's a big milestone for all of us. All right, more questions. And I told you this would be better if we just took questions, Todd. Just, um, if somebody's got to ask him a question to trip him up. Well, I get them. Well, you got recharge them. one. Yeah, that's it. All right, so look, again, you see, where's the massive fishbowl? There it is. One more chance to put your card there if you want to win an Echo Dot. We got time for, how about this? If, if people want to ask you questions, might be shy right after this. Will you take one, one, one more thing since it is carbon footprint. Oh, so, yeah. so a service vessel consumes, Cars. basically generates between 35 to 100 metric tons of CO2 per day, right? That equates to, for you to visualize that, that's equal to between 7,000 and 10,000 carbs. That's what service vessels do today. This machine, because the only carbon footprint that we're really calculating is when the service vessels have to drop it off and then come and pick it up. So if it only does that maybe four times a year, the carbon footprint for this machine will actually be equal to 180 cars. So you're gonna go from 10,000 to 180. Now where the EROV, or what we're branding now is the Liberty solution, that's equal, to, because that one's gonna be moved around about 25 times a year. That's carbon footprint per year is around 800 cars. So conventionally, the CO2 is 10,000 with a Liberty solution or EROV, 800 with this solution, 180, as far as a, a car equivalent. Okay, I wanna be respectful of everybody's time and everybody. Do you have any more questions before we draw for the